Good afternoon, everybody. We are live, and uh, we're live streaming here. I want to get your comments, your thoughts about the Cincinnati Bengals on the eve, on the cusp, I should say, of that uh, AFC championship game. A couple of uh, players have just uh, received awards that uh, I want to want to bring up to you. Pro Football Writers Association is named Jamar Chase, Rookie of the Year. No major upset there, of course. Jamar Chase had a prolific <laughs> Rookie season season with his partner in crime, Joe Burrow, the LSU Tigers, and now the Bengal Tigers, and they're doing it again. They did it in college. They're doing it in the National Football League. And Evan McPherson, Pro Football Writers Association, all rookie special teams, he of the golden leg, one of the most important, if not the most important kick in franchise history, the 52-yarder at the gun that advanced the Cincinnati Bengals to the AFC Championship game and sent the number one seed Tennessee Titans packing for the season. How about the Cincinnati Bengals? They knocked the Kansas City Chiefs off a little, about getting close to a month ago, uh, and knocked them out of an opportunity for the first seed in the National Football League playoffs. The Titans get it. The Bengals got down to Tennessee and knocked the Titans out as the number one seed. So they did it to a couple of people. We would like to hear your your thoughts, your comments about the Cincinnati Bengals, how they played against the Tennessee Titans, any questions you might have, and 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 looking forward to the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, I do want to – I'll give you some some things that I've done here from a research standpoint. Uh, one big thing, the Bengals, they're, they've got takeaways. They had three takeaways in the first game – or two takeaways in the first game and didn't have a giveaway – and in this last game, three takeaways, no giveaways. So they're plus four, five takeaways, one giveaway in the playoffs. That is monstrous. And against the Kansas City Chiefs in that regular season game, Patrick Mahomes gave the Bengals defensive backs a couple of opportunities. They, they got their hands on footballs. It can't just be a pass broken up, pass defense. It has to be that interception. He has a lot of confidence in that throwing arm, and he'll try to put it in tight windows a la Brett Favre and, and the great ones. When he does and he makes a mistake and you have an opportunity to make him pay for that mistake, you can't let him off the hook. You have to catch those interceptions. And there were a couple of opportunities in that first matchup that the Bengals let slip away. They ended up still winning the football game. But in Kansas City, it's going to be a horse of a different color. You know, Bengals had a lot of problems, uh, particularly up front in the offensive line, dealing with that crowd noise and communicating, recognizing fronts and, and uh, alignments and potential blitz packages, pressure packages, and communicating and up and down the line of scrimmage. The crowd noise was a huge factor. And what happened there is you might make a right decision, but because of the crowd noise, the communication, it, it took too long. And even a right decision is a wrong decision if it takes too long, because now you're already the defensive players already off the off the line of scrimmage and 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 you're behind. You're trying to play from behind, and that's never going to work. Uh, they're going to get pressure on the quarterback in that regard. You know, your only advantage is that snap count in the crowd noise. You have to look at the football just like that defensive player does. And if you can't communicate, you're trying to do hand signals to communicate uh, what's going on in terms of calls for assignments. So you're looking at that. You're looking at the football. The defensive lineman in front of you changes his alignment. You got to look at that. A lot going on, a lot going on, and you can be a half a beat behind because of all that. I've been there. It's tough, and, man, that's a huge factor out there in Kansas City. If you think it was loud in Tennessee, and it was, you ain't seen nothing yet. These fans out in Kansas City are rabid, and they are loud. They're in full throat all the time. Seattle was a really loud outdoor stadium. I think Arrowhead, even louder. I really do. I think it's the loudest outdoor stadium that there is in the National Football League. Seattle doesn't have an outdoor stadium anymore. but th So this one is by far currently the loudest outdoor stadium in the National Football League. Or Seattle had, had the dome, now they're outside. It is, it is though. It's Kansas City, Seattle. Those two are unbelievably loud. So that, that's going to be a huge factor in this football game. Here's something that people aren't going to talk about much during the course of the week, but this one is massive as well. Everything magnifies when you get to the playoffs in the National Football League. Hidden yards, field position are monstrous. The Kansas City Chiefs, special teams, 
They're coached by a guy named Dave Taub, who has got the same titles as Darren Simmons, special teams coordinator, assistant head coach. His punt coverage team in the regular season, number one in the NFL. His punt return team in the regular season, number three in the NFL. His kickoff coverage team in the regular season, fifth in the NFL. Kickoff return team, ninth in the National Football League. Every phase, all four phases of special teams for the Kansas City Chiefs, top 10 in the NFL, three in the top five in the NFL. That equates to winning average drive start, hidden yards, field position. When you have a quarterback and skilled players like the Kansas City Chiefs have and Patrick Mahomes and company, and then you put him on a short field, a shorter field than you're experiencing, and you put the opponent on a long field, that's that's coffin nails. I mean, that's a tough deal. So the Bengals are going to have to have a great day, not just a good day, a great day in special teams. There's no question about it. They're going to have to win the battle of hidden yards, put Mahomes on uh, long fields, make him go multiple plays to score, don't give up explosive plays, make him go on 9, 10 play drives, increase the chance the, for error during the course of that time frame. Explosives are, are tough because – they score without even having to really dip into their playbook much. And so you want to make them go on long, sustained drives, see if they can do it, get them into third down, get them into third and long, and get off the football field when you get them into third and long. Uh, defensively, that's, that's going to be the recipe. Takeaways, you take uh, possessions away from Mahomes and company and give extra possessions to your offensive football team, Joe Burrow and company. And uh, win field position, like I talked about with special teams, get them to third down, get them to third and long, get them off the football field. And then in the red zone, when the field's condensed, win in the red zone. Bengals offense, score touchdowns. Bengals defense, bend but don't break. Hold them to field goals. That's going to be a, oh, the ABCs of football. Takeaways, third down, red zone. All of those situational aspects of football that are also important. Bengals have to win all of them, at least have to win two out of three of them. There's no question about it. So it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. This is a, this has got big football game written all over it. And how about that weekend of football? Three games are decided by the visiting place kicker at the gun wins football games on the road. And then that Titanic battle, that immediate instant classic between Allen and Mahomes back and forth. They go. Track me. No turnovers in the game. No turnovers. So nobody gave up a possession. Nobody got an extra possession. It was score. I'll answer. I'll answer. I'll answer. It was unbelievable. And the, the relay, uh, it, in fact, in my mind, it was a track meet instead of a football game. And instead of a baton, it was a football. And the anchorman of the relay team, Tyreek Hill, when he broke that touchdown, all the yards after catch and broke that long touchdown. That was spectacular. And uh, that's, that's where the Bengals played so well in that first football game. Here's a, uh, here's some numbers on, uh, on what they got done in that, uh, in that first game, they hold these two great players, Hill and Kelsey. I mean, it, they, they just stymied them in, in the first encounter. Make sure I get the right numbers. I don't want to misquote the numbers here. Between the two of them, they had 11 catches for 65 yards. Hill had six for 40. His longest reception was 17 yards. Kelsey, five for 25. His longest reception was eight yards. 11 catches, 65 yards. That's under 11 yards per catch between those two guys who normally dictate outcomes of football games. That's going to be big. Obviously, what the Cincinnati Bengals have to do, though, uh, first and foremost, is Make sure they take care of the protection issues because you cannot afford to have your quarterback, Joe Burrow, hit as much as he was hit in that football game. It was ludicrous. I mean, 11, uh, nine sacks, 11 really, only nine counted. You had two that were um, taken off the, off the uh, board because the Bengals called a timeout before one of them, and there was a penalty before another one. So really, Joe Burrow took the hits – for 11 sacks, and then took additional quarterback hits. Going to have to protect your quarterback better. And that's everybody. 
The offensive line did not have a good enough day. They had identification problems, communication problems, technique problems. When there were line, defensive linemen twisting, they had problems passing them off. And one guy thought one thing, one guy thought another, passing players off to air, and they have a free run at the quarterback. All that's got to get tightened up. Uh, then the backs have to do a, a great job in blitz pickup. Tight ends are going to be involved in the protection some. And then the receivers have to win. I mean, quite honestly, the receivers didn't win in some occasions. And Joe Burrow had to hold on to the football a little bit longer. But there's no doubt that Mike Vrabel put together an unbelievable game plan. Unbelievable. Seven guys at the line of scrimmage. He would rush four. You didn't know which four he was going to rush of the seven guys. And that's where the Bengals had problems because in the loud stadium, when they were identifying and communicating, they were having issues with that. Um, so they got confused up front. And then on the back end, Vrabel kept changing his coverages up and disguising in what he was doing. And it really gave Joe Burrow some, some uh, pause. Joe was not as, uh, as quick in his decision-making as certain. I, Joe Burrow all season long, pre-snap read, uh, I've got some intel. I'm feeling pretty good. Post-snap, I'm confirming what I saw. I'm okay with this. Against the Titans, pre-snap, I think this might be it. Post-snap, uh, really doesn't look like it's it. And held the ball a little bit longer in a couple, in a few occasions. So it's everybody. And that's the case. There's always there's a story behind every pressure, every sack. Sometimes it's the offensive line. Sometimes it's the receivers not, uh, not winning their battles. Sometimes it's the quarterback holding the ball too long. Bottom line is all of it has to be improved and cleaned up because the Chiefs, they've got Chris Jones. He is right there amongst the best defensive tackles in the National Football League. He's an all-pro type player. He has nine quarterback sacks. Uh, that's in the top 25 in the National Football League, particularly as an interior rusher. That's well in the top 10 in the National Football League with interior rushers. Uh, Reed at defensive tackle had a sack. In the, in the Chiefs' big win uh, over the Buffalo Bills. He can put pressure on inside. Frank Clark on the edge. Melvin Ingram on the edge. They've got pass rushers, I'm telling you. And you have to think Steve Spagnuolo is going to say, oh, I'm looking at this tape. Oh, boy, there's no secrets in the National Football League, and everybody's a copycat. So what Mike Vrabel put together, Spagnuolo is going to try to formulate and maybe modify a little bit to fit what he does defensively. He's going to take those type of concepts and try to implement them. He's not going to totally copy what Mike Vrabel did because he doesn't have the same personnel necessarily in every position group like Mike Vrabel has. It's going to be different, but it's going to, it's going to be that type of – try to establish that type of confusion up front and mix it up in coverages on the back end. I mean, the Bengals, coaches – Players, particularly Joe Burrow, uh, he's the one that can crack the code the best on the football field. They're going to have to crack the code because right now Mike Vrabel has put a template out there, and it 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 bothered the Cincinnati Bengals. With that said, Joe Burrow still threw for over 340 yards now, and Chase still had his over 100 yards. And and let's uh, let's hit a couple of couple of uh, little little nuggets on that first encounter with the Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> How about Joe Burrow's numbers? 30 for 39, 446 yards, four touchdowns, no interception. Quarterback reading, rating of a mere 148. Are you kidding me? Almost a perfect quarterback rating. Jamar Chase, 12 targets, 11 catches, joining 66 yards. Averaged over 24 yards a catch, 72-yard touchdown. Three touchdowns total. Three of the four touchdown passes uh, that Joe Burrow had went to Jamar Chase, and Tyler Boyd had the other. So put up stupid numbers. Mahomes, 26 to 35, 259 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions, quarterback rating 113.9. It's going to be a battle. It's going to, it's going to look a lot like, in my opinion, it's going to look like instead of Mahomes Allen, Mahomes Burrow, part two is going to be like part one was in the football game, Buffalo Bills, Kansas City Chiefs. I think it could be that type of game, the Cincinnati Bengals and the uh, and the Kansas City Chiefs. We'll see. We'll see what how it how it transpires, but how about the way Lou Anarillo's defense is playing right now? They're playing their best football at the most opportune time. There's no two ways about it. I mean, the playoffs are here, and they are playing their best defensive football. They're playing fast. 
They're playing confident. They're playing at warp speed. They're not just playing fast. I mean, man, DJ Reader dominated the line of scrimmage. We're going to make an, a, an analogy. May, uh, baseball. Defensively, you want to be strong up the middle. Catcher, shortstop, center field. Usually you have a good defense if you have a good catcher, shortstop, center field. Look at the big red machine. You know, you have, you have Bench, Concepcion, Geronimo. Okay. The Bengals or a football team that's playing good defense. In the middle, you have nose tackle. DJ Reader's playing at a Pro Bowl level. Should have been in the Pro Bowl. Got snubbed, I think, as an interior defensive lineman. He's showing people now. He dominated Jones, the center for Tennessee. He was a good player. DJ Reader, play after play, snap after snap. Not just center. He lines up in the guard some. He was killing whoever his matchup was in the interior of the Tennessee Titans. He dominated them. So now you have a catcher slash nose tackle playing at a high level. Middle linebacker, shortstop, Logan Wilson, eight tackles, interception. How about the hit that he put on King Henry? One-on-one, -on -one, slams the shoulder into him right in his midsection, wraps him up, takes him to the ground. That shoulder's not bothering Logan Wilson anymore. Huge gain at middle linebacker. Shortstop, good range, made a lot of plays. Center fielder, Jesse Bates. First play of the game, interception, set the tone, reads the routes, good route recognition, breaks inside of the route, cuts inside, makes the big pick, sets the tone for the Cincinnati Bengals. They put points on the board right away. A big factor in the Bengals' success against the Titans, they played with a lead. They scored first. They scored early. They had their, their best quarter in this football game in terms of point difference was the first quarter. All season long, the worst quarter of the four quarters, all season long in totality, was the first quarter. They got scored by 40 points in the first quarter. In this football game against the Titans, they outscored the Titans in the first quarter and played with a lead throughout. Made a big, big difference. Tennessee Titans really couldn't, you know, I'm going to I'm going to play keep away and, and run away from you. They still ran the ball more than they threw it. I mean, that's their DNA, but it was only three snaps more. They ran the ball three snaps more than they threw it. And Tannehill had to throw to win the game. Now, if Tannehill's throwing because he wants to, very, very good. Running game's going, play action pass. But if he's throwing because he has to, because the running game is being controlled, and the Bengals controlled Derrick Henry, 20 carries, 62, 63 yards, a little over three yards a pop, Tannehill had, was throwing it because he had to. Three interceptions for the Cincinnati Bengals in totality. That's a few things that uh, thought about, looked at. There's there's so much to uh, consider in this football game. How about Patrick Mahomes' numbers, though, over a two-game stretch against the Pittsburgh Steelers' first playoff game? 404 yards, five touchdowns. Against the Buffalo Bills, 378 yards, three touchdowns. 782 yards passing, eight touchdowns in two games. He's also rushed for, for 98 on 10 carries, averaging almost 10 yards a pop. For 880 yards, 880 scrimmage yards, totally yards, whatever you want to call it, in two football games. <laughs> and he's uh, thrown for eight touchdown passes. The one thing about this football team, though, they lost 12 fumbles in the regular season. That's tied for most in the National Football League. They lost 12 fumbles. So get the ball out. Get the ball off of them. You know, at turnovers is such a big deal. Uh, they did have... 29 takeaways defensively, though, tied for fifth in the National Football League. And they recovered 14 fumbles, which is also tied for first in the NFL. So <laughs> the fumbles were, were a big deal. They lost a bunch of them, but they recovered more than they lost by two. So ball security in this one's going to be big. Kansas City Chiefs during the course of the season showed that they're going to force fumbles and they showed that they're going to put the ball on the ground. The Bengals have to high and tight ball security and get the ball off of the Kansas City Chiefs, take a possession away from Patrick Mahomes, give it to Joe Burrow, you're cooking with gas. Defensive stop is great. It doesn't have to be a three and out. Just if the Bengals can get the Chiefs to third down, third and long, get off the field, take a possession away from them going to be big. If the Chiefs do that to Joe Burrow and the Bengals, it's going to be big for them as well. It's going to be massive in this game. What do we got, Dave? 
All right. Well, it's good to be back in the studio with you, Dave. Yes. Good to see you, man. You're looking good. And we want to thank First Star Logistics for lunch. Absolutely. Nothing wrong with a good Donato's pizza. No. Uh, got some comments. We're going to start with this one from Twitter. Brian Sin Bengals says, DL in the trenches, can you try to get our good friend John Popovich? From Popo. W, used to be WCPO. Yes. As a guest on the podcast because the Bengals playoff run got me thinking of the glory days of sports of all sorts <laughs> and you being a regular on the panel. There has to be a ton of great stories to mine out of that. Yeah, Popo, in, in my opinion, John Popovich was the greatest storyteller in sports. I mean, a tremendous writer, said a lot in so few words. He was a tremendous, tremendous communicator, tremendous broadcaster, unbelievable storyteller. And on top of all that, maybe as fine a human being as has ever walked this God's green earth, Popo's the best. Next was Tim Trey. This came on Facebook. It was a message on Facebook. It says, hi, Dave. As a Ravens fan, yeah. we won't hold that against him. No. All I can say is go Bengals. There you go. Bring it home for the AFC North. Uh, he also added, he goes, he's a trucker, and he listens to the broadcast on XM, and they're great. I appreciate that very much. You know, um, I, I like the fact that if uh, if your team is knocked out of the playoffs, why not root for the division? I like that. I think the AFC North fans, hopefully the AFC North fans are are jumping on board with that mindset. Uh, that 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 makes some sense. You know, just carry the flag of the AFC North, carry it loud and proud, and uh, see if the Bengals can get it done. One Nation Underground, are the Bengals <laughs> practicing in PBS and pumping in sound? Oh, yeah. They're at Paul Brown Stadium, and that, that's happened, I mean, back when Paul Brown was head coach. <laughs> Uh, we'd pump in crowd noise sound when we were going on the road to uh, a noisy, hostile environment. That's been going on forever. And they're cranking up the sound as, as loud as they possibly can. But it's tough to duplicate. You know, you have a couple of – you have speakers. That's about it. When it, when it is a throng of seventy five to 80,000 people, and the way they built the stadium, it kind of encapsulates the noise. It doesn't go up straight up and dissipate. It brings it back down into the stadium by design, by architectural design. Man, it is loud, really loud. It's it's very, very hard to duplicate. The crowd noise is hard to duplicate. You do it as best you can. Another thing hard to duplicate, the speed of Tyreek Hill. There's not many people walking the face of the earth that can run as fast as Tyreek Hill. This guy has legitimate world-class speed when you're saying, all right, I'm going to give you a good picture of what you're going to see with Tyreek Hill in this football game. Hard to do, almost impossible to do. The good news is they saw it. They saw it at Paul Brown Stadium. They saw how fast he is. He can get behind and run by anybody. Uh, so they do have a taste of it, and I think that's going to be big. I think uh, that flavor is going to stay with them as they go to Kansas City. Ethan Richards says, hey, Dave, what's your favorite jersey combo for the Bengals? I, I like, honestly, I like the white, the white on white. I think it's clean. I, th I like the stripes. I like, I like everything about the, the white on white stripes on the pants. Uh, whatever you want to do with the socks, black, orange, I'm, you know, I'm not really, I don't really get into that all that much, but I like that combination with the, uh, the orange helmet and the black stripes. I think that looks really cool. I think it really pops. I think it, uh, it makes a statement. Strange Shreds says, Mixon, 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 keep Mahomes off the field. That's going to be a factor. Uh, there's no there's no doubt about it. And in the first battle, Joe Mixon, 12 carries, 46 yards, a 13-yard long rush, 3.8 per carry. He also was targeted eight times, caught seven of them for 40 yards. So he had 86 scrimmage yards on 19 uh, touches, which isn't terrible. He had over uh, 100 scrimmage yards in, in last week's victory in the playoffs against the Titans between he had a little over 50 uh, rushing and a little over 50 receiving. So on 20 carries, he had over 100, uh, 20 touches. He had over 100 scrimmage yards. That's fine. I mean, keep getting Joe Mixon the football. To me, it doesn't matter, you know, handing it off to him, get him out there on the edge and screens, Little check down, uh, receiving, turn and run and catch the uh, after, yards after catch, run after catch of the football. I think Joe Mixon and CJ Uzama are both going to be big in that regard. Maybe some 
short passes, intermediate passes, catch the football, get your pad squared up, get them low, get yards after contact. Tackling is going to be huge in this football game. Look at all the yards after contact the Bengals got against the Tennessee Titans. I mean, Jamar Chase, a one-yard, the ball's in the air one yard down the football field. He makes a corner miss 56 yards later. It's a 57-yard play. Uh, the field is flipped. Now the Bengals are in the red zone and the scoring zone. Huge. Um, which football team is going to be able to generate yards after catch? Which football team is going to gang tackle and minimize yards after catch? It's going to be massive. Randy Byers. We're always glad to see Randy Byers. Basically asking questions about some play. Who's going to be playing Sunday on the defensive line? Uh, is Sample going to be back and so forth? Yeah, that's that's going to be – that's to be determined. Uh, Josh Tupal played – as many snaps as he could in the uh, Tennessee Titan game. He's got a uh, sprained MCL. Uh, so, you know, he, he's battling that. I, I, I do think he's going to make the dance. It, it'll be a matter of how many snaps he can go. Sample has a groin injury. All depends on the severity. Uh, the higher, in my mind, the higher the groin injury, more toward uh, the, the, you know, the abdominal area, the, the worse it is. If it's in the belly, if it's in the middle of the groin, uh, it's less severe. If it's down closer to the kneecap, it's that's the best situation to have. Just like a hamstring, you don't want the hamstring up by the buttocks, pull way up there, and the belly in the middle is more tolerable. Down by the kneecap, the bottom of the hamstring is, is the easiest normally to rehab and recover from. So I don't know what's going on in terms of the location of these pulls and how severe they are, but uh, we'll see as uh, practice unfolds. Practice will start tomorrow. And there'll be injury reports, but those guys are definitely going to be on the injury list. Will they uh, not participate at all? Will they participate limited? Um, I think it's going to be one of those two in the beginning of the week. It won't be full participation early on, but I think they'll get there. With that said, though, I, I, I think uh, it's 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 very interesting to give guys credit where credit's due because of those injuries. Tyler Shelvin, he had some – Decent moments. He had some moments that weren't so good, and you got to get over that inconsistency, play on a more consistent level. But Tyler Shelvin's uh, snap count increased. Zach Kerr, who they picked up off the uh, off the practice squad of the Arizona Cardinals, he gave them some snaps. He he flashed a couple times, made some plays. Uh, Clay Johnston, the play that he made on that two-point conversion where he came down from the backside of the formation right down the line of scrimmage and tackled Henry short of the uh, the goal line on the two-point conversion, was big. That was a huge play. So you had guys step up and increase their role, um, take on a bigger a bigger percentage of uh, snaps uh, during the course of the football game, and, and they, it paid off. They made plays for the Cincinnati Bengals, and that's what you have to have. You have to have roster depth. You have to have players that are ready to be the, quote, next man up and give you good snaps, not just go out there and, you know, fill a role and not really play at a, at a very high level. These guys went out there and played at a high level and made contributions to the football team. So that's all good. Anthony Kennedy, do you see the Bengals offense matching up better against the Chiefs defense given the higher blitz percentage under which Burrow thrives? The Raiders and Titans were not high blitz teams. They weren't. Um, but what the what the uh, Titans did is they they crowded the line of scrimmage with seven given the appearance of a blitz, they only rushed four of them. The key was they rushed different guys a lot. And then they did stunts and twists behind it. Um, I do think that I wonder if Spagnolo will not blitz quite as much. I wonder if he'll ease up on the blitz percentage. He has to hope that his four-man rush can get home. Uh, you got to be able to put the pressure on the quarterback with just four rushers. Like I said, with Jones, Reed, Clark, and on the edge, Ingram, that's not a bad starting point. You know, I mean, I think he'll mix it up. I'm not sure that he'll blitz as much as high a percentage as he has because uh, Joe Burrow slices it up. And Joe Burrow, when you're when you are not successful, you don't get home on the blitz and you have one-on-one -on -one coverage on the, at, at the cornerback position, that's where the Chiefs – the Chiefs at corner aren't really – they don't, you know, scare you to death. Um, the big deal is, will Matthew be back? 
he he went out early in the football game, got kicked in the back of the head, uh, had a pretty good concussion, supposedly. Will he be back for the football game? He and Thornhill at safety, that's a pretty good tandem. Hughes and Sneed and Fenton at corner, pedestrian, you know, guys. And all Jamar Chase did was go for 266 yards and three touchdowns. What the heck? I would think <laughs> that Spagnuolo would say, I'm not sure I'm going to blitz and have somebody try to cover Chase one-on-one. -on -one. I don't think he'll do it even if he does blitz. I think that he'll have a safety over the top to help Chase. But that's where everybody else has to step up. I mean, that's where T. Higgins, T. Higgins in the first game, didn't have a lot of catches, but he averaged over 20 yards on his catches. I think he had three. Yeah, he did. Three catches for 62 yards, averaged 20.7 per, had a 39-yard reception. T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd, C.J. Uzama. This, this is the issue that Spagnuolo is going through right now. The key is figure out how to handle the pressure packages. Because like I said, Mike Vrabel has put a blueprint out there. The Bengals coaches, players have to crack the code. Say, all right, okay, we understand. Now the common denominator is our communication, our recognition and communication problems were due to crowd noise, and we're still dealing with that crowd noise. They played the Chiefs at Paul Brown Stadium when they beat them. Much different dynamic going out to Arrowhead. The Chiefs have hosted the last four AFC championship games. In the last eight games at home in the playoffs, the Chiefs are seven and one. Enough said. I mean, that crowd, look at look at all you fans that were at Paul Brown Stadium. During the first playoff game against the uh, the Raiders, you shared in the victory. You were a huge factor in the Bengals' win. For the Bengals to go down to Tennessee and beat that football team, a good football team, in their place with all that crowd noise, heck of an accomplishment. So you put that in your memory bank. You go to Kansas City and you try to improve on the things that you didn't do well. And one of the biggest things you didn't do well was handle the pressure on your quarterback, Joe Burrow. Give him time. Give him space. He will dissect opponent defenses. Sin Cinder trees, Sates. Remember, they dropped a couple of Mahomes yep. interceptions last time. Talked about They'll that. They'll catch him this time uh, when they're there. And a uh, little, yeah. little sneak peek who we spoke to before we did this live stream. So make sure you watch. Uh, Lou Anarumo. Lou yeah. Anarumo, and, yep. and we brought that up. Yeah, it was talked about. And uh, it was talked about after the game. I mean, um, you know, what, when you're facing a great quarterback, if he makes a mistake, you have to make him pay. You can't let him off the hook, man. And uh, he, he will give you – he'll probably – he'll give you a chance. He'll give you a chance. Maybe he'll give you a couple of chances. The other thing about him, look at what he did with his feet against the Buffalo Bills. My gosh. I mean, he was, he was killing them um, just right up the gut. They're, they're vacating the middle of the football field with their safeties. They're helping on receivers, and the linebackers are, you know, working with Kelsey, and there's all kinds of real estate, and Mahomes made them pay, uh, particularly when they had their backs turned to them. And like I said, in two playoff games, 10 rushes for 98 yards. Joe Burrow can do the same thing. Which quarterback is going to hurt you with his feet and his legs as much as he hurts you with the throwing arm? Both of these guys – have the ability to do that. Remember last year in the playoffs, Mahomes was one-legged. Remember that toe injury? He couldn't run. Mahomes has got speed. Mahomes 4'6 or better. Mahomes can run. Joe Burrow's the same deal. Both of these quarterbacks are good athletes in terms of not just throwing the football, but being able to beat you with their feet and legs as well. Dustin Goff asked Lap, what can we do to help the line against the Chiefs? Well, first and foremost, uh, you have to do a better job of recognizing uh, what you, what the defense is aligning themselves in. Sometimes you have a hard time recognizing. It all starts on, you'll see the center and quarterback in sub packages on third down pointing to a player. They're identifying the middle linebacker. All the protection responsibilities come after they identify the middle linebacker. It may not be a linebacker. It might be a safety if they get five or six defensive backs out in the football field. But they have to determine the player that they are designating as the one that they're going to base all their protection assignments off of. So that's the first thing. They have to recognize properly. Then they have to communicate all the assignments. So they have to figure out a way to handle that. In my opinion, 
What I would do is I would go with less. I would shrink it. I would run fewer protections. I would give them fewer rules, fewer responsibilities, be able to apply these rules to as many defensive looks as you possibly can. Have, you know, one rule cover eight different fronts. Don't cloud the mind, clutter the mind with all this stuff to try to sort through. Like I said, it's so fast. You're at the line of scrimmage. The clock, the play clock's winding down. You, you can't hear. You got to look at the football. Your only, your only uh, edge, your only advantage is gone. The snap count. You can't hear the snap count. Defensive players looking at the football. You have to look at the football. He's going forward. He's quicker. He's faster. You have to go backwards. You're not as quick and as fast as he is. It's tough. It's tough. So don't overload the mind with too much. Simplify. Be real confident in what you're doing. And when you're confident, you can execute it at a much higher level and a much higher speed. If there's doubt in your mind and you're unsure, eh, should I be doing this? You're dead. If it's like, I got him, I'm going here, you got a good chance. So make the mind as clear as possible, as uncluttered as possible. And I think that's a big deal. And uh, and then, you know, Joe's going to have to do a good job if they start to disguise coverages and everything, try to decipher and, and try to get the ball out of his hand. Um, sometimes he held the ball a little bit too long. And, you know, he's thinking, I've uh, manipulated this pocket before. I'm going to make this guy miss. I'm going to spin away from this guy. These defensive people are so – they're good athletes. It's harder to do that pirouette and, and get out and around defensive ends when they're getting good edge rush. The National Football League, they're, they're incredible uh, athletes. So uh, Joe's going to have to realize, all right, eat it, take the sack, or throw it away, live for another down. Don't hold on to the football. And the worst thing to do – is try to make a play that the odds of making it are less than 10% and you add additional yards to a quarterback sack. You know, you you lose five more, six more, seven more. Pretty soon, you know, you're getting close to losing another first down that you need to get back on one play. So those are the kind of things. Then also wide receivers, sharp, crisp, quick routes. You have to win. You have to win. You have to, your goal has to be to win Every single route, now, that's going to be impossible. But if you try to, you know, the goal is to win every single one of them, you know, hopefully you'll win 75% of them. You have to give Joe options. You have to give Joe an opportunity to throw the football. In some cases, you know, that where he wanted to go with the football, they didn't win. And at that point, he didn't have enough time to get to another option or two. So it's, it's going to be, it's going to have to be a much better effort and execution by all concerned. Offensive line, quarterback, wide receivers, running bats and blitz pickup, tight ends if they stay in to help, because that's another thing you can do. Keep a tight end in. We call it slow blocking. Tight end in to help against the edge rush. You can chip with the back on the other defensive end. But at that point, you're taking two players out of the route, initial route, by keeping him in the block. He doesn't even get in the route. The back will get in the route later. But, boy, now you have a lot of defensive backs back there covering fewer receivers. So now it's numbers game that's uh, going against you. So this is the chess match that we're talking about here. So there, there's a lot to it. Get the ball out of the quarterback's hand earlier. Short game, quick game, going to be big. Spagnolo knows that. I'm going to crowd the coverage. I'm going to crowd the coverage. going to try to take short intermediate stuff away. That's what Vrabel did a good job of. You can do that when you only rush four and you have seven in coverage. Take away the short game, the quick game, you still have people on the back end, the deep end to cover. They had a great game plan, and they executed it well. Wayne Downey, I hope you continue broadcast for a long, long time, and I especially hope to hear you say, <laughs> I don't want to say, <clears throat> that is yours. Yeah, yeah. Bam, bam, bam. Uh, that's, yeah, the coffin nails, bam, 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 have taken on a life of their own there, but that's uh, that's that's just pure gold because – when we do say that, and we've waited to make sure that if we say it, we're not going to get burned. <laughs> we're going to make sure that the game definitely is over. But in, in the National Football League, a lot of times you never know. Uh, but, yeah, that's always that's always fun. because That means the Cincinnati Bengals have another, another uh, victory. They have another game that went in that left-hand column, went in that dub column, that big W. 
Gina says, is Geno Atkins not healthy enough to sign and help the Bengals? Geno Atkins, uh, at the end of his career, the last year he was with the Bengals, it was time to go. You know, you, you can't play forever. Geno Atkins is, uh, you know, he's aging like everybody does. Um, I guess the only exception to that rule is Tom Brady, and he's, he's even contemplating retirement, I think, now. He's still playing at a high level, but Geno Atkins uh, to, to say, all right, come in and, uh, and, and go play football when all you've done is play with your kids, grandkids, whatever, and uh, walk your dog or whatever you've done. That, that, that's a tough deal. I mean, as great an athlete, as great a, a physical specimen as Geno Atkins with, you know, you, I, I'd much rather pick up a player like they picked up who had been playing all season long and was in football shape. There's conditioning and then there's football shape. The football shape is taking the hits and recovering from those hits and all that sort of thing. Zach Kerr played with the Arizona Cardinals all year long. I, I can't imagine how sore Geno Atkins would be if he came off the street, played in a playoff game at the intensity level of that playoff game, and woke up the next morning, rigor mortis. Wouldn't be able to get out of bed. Be like uh, the Tin Man. Oil can. Oil can. Can't move. Got to lube up all the joints, man. That would be brutal he knows it the team knows it that's reality jason love says he would wants to see a pick six by the secondary yeah that but, dog would hunt right there jason big play yeah you know that that's another little thing that uh that's very interesting um the kansas city chiefs have four return touchdowns four of them and that's amongst the league leaders so i mean in terms of special teams uh, pick sixes, fumble recoveries, four defensive scores, four unscripted, unconventional scores. So you can't allow them to do that, and it would be great, as you say, if the Cincinnati Bengals can get an unscripted, unconventional score. I mean, that's that's like bonus money. That's found gold. That's something that you didn't anticipate. That's sweet sugar right there. Another question from Sin, Sin Industries. Basically talking about the honey badger. Is he still in the protocol? That wouldn't be good for the Chiefs. Yeah, he's in protocol right now. I'll guarantee you that. Um, will he be in protocol for the entire week? Possibly. You think he might play in the football game? Hell yeah. If he clears protocol, um, he'll play. He'll play. Now, protocol, basically, when you're in concussion protocol, they you have you take this cognitive test before the season starts. That gives you a baseline. When your brain is functioning at a normal level, here's the things that it's capable of doing. So you have this baseline of cognitive results on this test. After a concussion, you have to take the same test again. And if you can't match that level of cognitive reasoning, they don't clear you out of concussion protocol. So that's what we're talking about. Every player tolerates concussions differently. Uh, some players handle severe concussions better than others. And there's different levels of concussion. There's, you know, a minor, uh, moderate, and severe. And, and different players handle concussions differently. And it also depends on how many concussions you've had. The more concussions you have, I mean, your skull becomes almost like an eggshell. It cracks easier. And, you, and concussions are more prevalent. And you're prone to them. I don't know the concussion history of Matthew. And that's also a consideration in concussion protocol. How many of these has he had? And, you know, in, in the court, in, in the form of player safety, which is what the Players Association is all about, you have to protect a player from himself sometimes. It's like, man, this is your third concussion this year. This is your seventh concussion of your career. You know, we, we, have, we have problems with this. So, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. And I don't know what all the, all the details and all the factors are in Tyron Matthew, but let's let's put it this way if he can play if there's any chance he can play he's going to want to play will the team and the nfl and the medical people and all that will they allow him to play because it's not up to the player the player has to be cleared so uh concussion protocol protects the player from himself and i wish there was around when i played i, I had a i had a severe concussion um up in cleveland and I didn't know where we were. I mean, I was serpentining off the field. I was, there was a tipped interception, tip ball interception. I go to make the tackle, get my head in front, perfect form tackle. 
Return guys, defensive backs, knee hits me in the head. And another player coming in to make a tackle hits me on the other side of my head. Boom, boom. And I was like, whoa, long distance phone call. Nobody's home. Nobody's answering. It's ringing. Come on, somebody pick up. It's ringing, ringing, ringing. I was, uh, I was hurting. Go to the sideline. It cracked the smelling salts, kind of snapped me out of it a little bit. Uh, the trainer says, you know, follow my finger. Ask me my name. Got that. Where are we? <sighs> Had no idea. So I, I look down at the grass and see it's grass, not turf. Artificial turf was the Bengals field at that time we were playing. So I knew we were on the road. I looked up at the scoreboard and uh, we were the visitor. So I didn't, you know, I, I think it would be visitor, but usually the home team has their team name up there. I saw it was Cleveland. I said, we're in Cleveland. I get cleared to go back in the game. I go back in the game and function decently. But after the game, Anthony's like, uh, lap. Anthony Munoz, who I was playing next to, lap. I, some of those calls you were making, man, were you false calling or what? I'm like, Anth, I don't remember the game. I don't remember the second half. I was probably making calls from high school. I, I, don't, I don't remember anything. And it's like, Phew. and the trainer came up to me and said, you know, uh, when you go home tonight, set your alarm clock to go off every hour. I said, I have to wake up every hour. Yeah. If you don't wake up, it's not good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's not good. You're right. So I had to wake up every hour. And, uh, that was part of the protocol, I guess, back then. Uh, but that wasn't, that was dumb on my part and, uh, should have been smarter than that, but, um, felt, didn't, know, didn't know any better back then. Felt like I could play. And if you feel like you can play, you go. And they, you're right, Dave, there was, there was no uh, research studies done on brain injury and concussions and uh, the, the the after effects of it and long term effects of uh, concussion and uh, you know at this point you know functioning okay where are we is this first our logistics <laughs> so far it's it's going it's going okay so we'll see we'll see Evan Sweeney says everyone is sleeping on our defense <laughs> no more communication problems and no false starts. This is the AFC Championship. Bring your best. Right on. Right on. Play to win. Don't play not to lose. Get after it. Bring your best. Absolutely. 100,000%. And honestly, I'm not sure everybody's sleeping on our defense right now. Defense won that football game against the Tennessee Titans. That was a defensive victory. And you could say the same thing again for the, in the Raiders game. That was a defensive struggle. You know, both teams put up yards. Not a whole lot of points scored. And, uh, you know, Pratt's interception, historic. Historic. How about the two linebackers? Pratt has a historic interception to seal the Raiders game. Wilson on the tip. Eli Apple makes a great play. Route recognition tips the ball. Logan Wilson runs to the ball. Like he said, when you run to the ball, good things happen. He runs to the football, gets an interception. The two inside linebackers basically have won the football game with takeaways for the Cincinnati Bengals. We're not talking defensive backs. We're talking linebackers making interceptions. Logan Wilson, that was his fifth. He had four in the regular season. That was his fifth pick. It's big stuff. I like this one from John Duckin. Why is nobody mentioning the fact we ended a red-hot Kansas City winning yeah. streak and a four-game winning streak the Raiders was on? Five. It doesn't matter who, what, when, where is there. We are here this day. Eight game winning streak. Great point, John. Eight game winning streak. Uh, Kansas City comes into Cincinnati, lose. Five game winning streak. The uh, the Raiders go on, uh, and I, it, maybe it was four. They had to win every one of them. I know that they could not lose any of the last four or five games, whatever it was. If they lost any one of them, they were done. They weren't in the playoffs. They win them all. And they get in the playoffs. And they come to Cincinnati, boop, over. Yep, no question. Big time. And that Kansas City not only ended their eight-game winning streak, it knocked them out of the first seed in the playoffs. And that they, they were playing for it. It wasn't like the Kansas City Chiefs didn't care about the game, resting players. No, 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 no. They wanted that number one seed, and they got knocked off. And uh, they'll have some blood in their eye about that. There's no doubt they'll remember that that 34-31 loss knocked them out of the number one seed and getting a bye, an all-important bye, uh, during the playoffs. Fortunately, the Bengals went and knocked off Tennessee because now Kansas City doesn't have to travel. You know, the Bengals said, ah, you're not going to get that number one seed, but we'll knock off the number one seed, and we'll see you over in Cincinnati. 
is the way it worked out. And you better believe the Chiefs will have blood in their eye and say, ha, huh, yeah, okay, we get a rematch. We get a rematch here in Kansas City at Arrowhead Stadium. This is the fourth straight AFC championship game we're hosting, and we're 7-1 and one in our last eight games at Arrowhead. The Bengals have got uh, travel protocols figured out, though. They've won six games, five in the regular season, one in the playoffs, on the road. They were five and two in my mind because the Cleveland game I throw out. That ended up making them five and three on the road. They were five and two because that Cleveland game was basically an inner squad scrimmage the way the Bengals handled, handled it. They rested all their starters, every one they possibly could. So um, they've won a good number of, of football games on the road, and they know how to travel, and they know how to prepare and play on the road. Another question, One Nation Underground. Can the Chiefs' defensive players match what the Titans did? Are you tight? Well, if you're talking about effort, we'll soon see. Schematically, that's up to Spagnolo. I'm not sure that he'll do the exact scheme that uh, Mike Vrabel did, but he'll take uh, the concepts, the philosophy, and apply them to his packages. So the Bengals are going to have to adjust, and the Chiefs are adjusting, and then you adjust to adjustments. That's what the National Football League is, a big chess match. Here's how I'm starting the game. All right, well, that's what you're doing. I have to adjust what I'm doing. Okay, well, and not only are the halftime adjustments big, every time they come to the sideline, watch players. They go sit on the bench as a unit, and they all have iPads, and the coaches are going over stuff, and they're, they're making adjustments after every single series. And that's why Bill Belichick over the years has been so great. Bill Belichick will run one defense in the first quarter, maybe the entire half, but the second half, you're getting something totally different. And a lot of times he'll go first, second, third, and fourth. He'll have four different things that he's going to you know, go to defensively. And he has such uh, versatile personnel. And that's what Lou Anarumo has on his defensive football team. Very, very versatile personnel. I want to give a shout out to uh, one of those versatile guys, Trey Flowers, wearing number 33 for the Cincinnati Bengals. Trey Flowers is covering the tight ends now. Trey Flowers is going to be a factor on Kelsey. Trey Flowers has done a really good job for the Cincinnati Bengals, giving them a long, athletic, big, good-sized safety. He's played with Seattle, and, and he's doing a great job for Lou Anarumo if he decides to put a defensive back on, on a, a tight end one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, he's also, when Stanley Morgan's been down the last couple of weeks because of a hamstring injury in the first two playoff games, he played gunner for Stanley Morgan, made plays out there at the gunner position on special teams. And that's, I'm talking about an unsung aspect. Stanley Morgan's been huge for Darren Simmons all year long. He's been one of his best core special teams players. He went down. Trey Flowers gave him great special team snaps, gave him great snaps on the defense in terms of playing uh, tight ends. And not just tight ends, he can do other things as well on the football field as a defensive pack, uh, back in their sub packages when they go five and six defensive backs. So that's uh, that's another guy. You know, there's there's a whole lot of guys, a whole lot of unsung guys. We talked, we've talked about quite a few of them already. Uh, at the at the secondary level, uh, I would I would tip my cap to Flowers. At linebacker, how the, about the play Clay Johnston made, we talked about on fourth down against King Henry. And that was that was huge. And uh, now at uh, it, you know up in the up in the defensive line, you have Zach Kerr, who they just signed. Uh, he he showed up. He flashed. He made some plays. So, who's going to step up? Who's going to make plays? This, this whole playoff scenario, it's it's it, it's a key in every game. But the bigger the game, the bigger the keys all become. Who's going to make plays and who's going to avoid mistakes? And that is a lot, a lot of great coaches, and I agree with this. More games are lost than won because these players are so good in the NFL. A lot of players are going to make big plays. They're going to make plays. Which team is most disciplined to avoid the big mistake? Because that big mistake usually is the thing that loses football games. Who's going to make the big play and who's going to avoid the big mistake? That's going to be a big factor in this football game. We'll try to go through some more here real quick. As we're approaching about an hour into this live stream, we want to thank everybody for being with us. 
on In the Trenches with Dave Lappin, brought to you by First Star Logistics from the First Star Logistics Studios. Yes. Daryl Haskins, or Hoskins, Hendrickson looked ineffective in the Titans game, was still foggy from concussion, question mark. Um, I think Trey Hendrickson is, uh, um, if you watch snap-by-snap basis on the tape, he did an unbelievable job setting an edge in the running game, not allowing Derrick Henry to get outside turning everything back inside where DJ reader and everybody was roaming. I thought Trey Hendrickson gave him a lot of quality snaps. Um, I, I think if he, if there was any issue with concussion and he was at least a bit foggy, he wouldn't have been out on the football field. He's battled the shoulder injury all season long. You'll see him multiple times during the season, left the field with an arm slump hanging. That's the biggest problem. Biggest problem is physical, not, not a concussion. The biggest problem is, you know, being able to make sure that you can fight through that shoulder problem. Uh, and, and those kind of things can be nagging. You know, I mean, they can, the only, the only uh, thing that is going to bring him back 100% with his shoulder and all these guys, a lot of these guys are playing with nicks and bumps and bruises at this stage of the season. If you're hundred percent healthy, you haven't played, you haven't played much. Zach Kerr may be as healthy as anybody. He hasn't gotten a whole lot of snaps with the Arizona Cardinals when they activated JJ Watt. So he may, he may have the, the freshest legs at this point in time. Uh, if you played every game from week one, you're you're struggling. You know, you're physically you're you're not right. <laughs> when you get out of bed, you got issues. The only thing that's going to help it is an off season of recovery time and workouts and rehabs and all those sort of things. So he's in he's in that mode. You know, he's he's uh, rounding third and heading for home. And he's you know the tank uh, the tank is not full. It's less than half full right now. That's that's the way it is with everybody. But when you're playing for a, a championship, adrenaline's an unbelievable thing. <laughs> I do remember the adrenaline rushes, and literally you feel like you can pick the stadium up if you can find it. You got to make sure you keep your wits about you and your head about you so you can find it. You can't play out of your mind. I call it a controlled rage. You start feeling that adrenaline rush, but you can't let it just overcome you where – you you're you just like out of out of control mentally. You have to know your assignments. You have to be disciplined in your assignments. So there's that line of demarcation. You have to. There's a fine line there, and everybody has to be able to get to it. You know, the way that they see best. We get this question often. Dave says, "Hey, Dave, you are always one of my favorite Bengals." You wore number 62. I was born in 62. <laughs> Wanted to ask if you would ever throw your hat in the ring to become a coach. And you've you've answered that a yeah. times, but we have new people coming into our live stream sure. all the time. Um, early on, uh, right after I was done playing, had opportunities to coach at the college or professional level, potentially. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's a family decision. And my, uh, you know, I decided that didn't want to necessarily hopscotch around uh, like a coach would have to do, particularly at the college level with recruiting and you're on the road so much. And um, so decided to go the broadcast way instead of the coaching way. And if I had decided to coach, it's easier to go player, coach, broadcaster than go player, broadcaster, coach. You know, that's a that's a different – it has happened, but it's, it's, not, it's not the norm. It's more of the rare scenario. So um, decided to throw my hat in the broadcast uh, – aspect of it. I did know that I wanted to stay involved with football in some way, shape or form, but, uh, I was able to do other, other things, sold, uh, industrial chemicals, industrial adhesives, uh, did, did all kinds of, uh, all kinds of different things, uh, along with the broadcasting part of it. And at that point realized how fortunate I was to be able to live the dream and play professional football, uh, for 12 seasons. So, um, I'm, I'm very blessed and feel very fortunate. And I do, though, from time to time and during football season, more than time to time, wonder if I had tried the coaching, how would it have worked out? One of my great friends in football, Dick Geron, um, we, we would say to each other as we were players, you know, when we get into the coaching end of it, whoever gets the head coaching job first hires the other guy. If I get it, you're my defensive coordinator. If, uh, if you get it, at least make me your offensive line coach. And, you know, we, we had this little thing we do, and, and uh, I got into the broadcast part of it. He got into the coaching part of it. Brilliant guy, great player for Yale, Detroit Lions, Cincinnati Bengals, broke Calvin Hill's records at Yale. Um, 
He was player of the year when I when we were in high school. He's two years older than me, but he was the player of the year in Massachusetts at Swampscott High School in football. And he was all state in basketball. And he was an all state baseball player. <laughs> he was unbelievable athlete in high school. Well, he got into the coaching aspect of it. And he was a head coach with the Buffalo Bills. Um, and I'm trying to think of where the other he was a head coach at two different two different football uh, organizations. Dick Chiron, brilliant mind, uh, brilliant guy, brilliant football coach. So I often wondered, how would it have gone if I get into the uh, the coaching arena like Dick Chiron did? Never know. Another question, Jim Harden. Dave, do you feel red zone efficiency will be the key? I already know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be huge. You, you can't score field goals against Kansas City, but – this, this team has proven you can win with field goals. Yeah. Well, that's because their their defensive red zone has been so good. They hold the Raiders to one touchdown and five red zone opportunities. And they hold the uh, uh, um, the Titans to one touchdown in three red zone opportunities. So combined in the playoffs, they've only allowed two touchdowns in, in eight red zone opportunities. Six other times, they either kicked the field goal or – didn't score interception, whatever the case may be. Like the Raiders, that was in the red zone. No points in the red zone. No field goal, no touchdown, no nothing. Squadoosh. That is the ultimate. But you're right. You can't settle for three too many times. You got to put seven on the board if you're the Bengals offense. And uh, in the beginning of the season, they were converting an over a 70% clip of a percentage of touchdowns scored in the red zone. And it's steadily declined. They have to, they have to get back to being that uh, – you know, that red zone finisher that they were, it's going to be big. And the further you advance against the better opponents, red zone becomes a, a massive, massive scenario. I want to remind everybody, you can also catch Dave Lapham in the trenches on your, wherever you get your podcast from. We put many of the, the videos that we do on YouTube. We take the audio, put it up on the podcast for those who want to listen on the go. Also, if, before you leave this live stream, make sure you hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed yet to In the Trenches with Dave Lappin, please do so and uh, help us grow the channel. Yes. Uh, a lot of great, great, great questions no today, doubt. Dave. We got, we got um, a bunch of smart football fans. I love you guys. One, one Nation Underground, another question. Should the Bengals put a spy on the homes? You know, it's it's interesting. The, uh, uh, the Raiders put a spy on Joe Burrow because of his his movement ability. But, man. When you put a spy on Mahomes, you're taking somebody out of coverage. So what do you, what do you do? Do you say, okay, I'm going to live with whatever Mahomes might do uh, with his feet as opposed to taking somebody, either a linebacker out of coverage potentially on Kelsey, if they bracket in Kelsey with a linebacker and a safety, it's one less guy to deal with the tight end in the middle of the football field. Or if they spy with a safety, you know, one less guy to deal with Tyreek Hill in the back end. So, you know, you're you're basically, uh, unless you can petition the league and allow Canadian football rules and have 12 men on the field defensively, and you could you could end up uh, going with the spy, and, and that would be great. But so you have to decide. Uh, th does it dictate, does it warrant having a spy on Mahomes? I'll guarantee you the Buffalo Bills, when Mahomes took off up the gut there, when the Red Sea parted in protection, and there was nobody in the middle of the football field. He ran 25 yards before anybody came in the in the picture on TV. It's like, where is everybody? And, boy, the Buffalo Bills were so conscious. They play a lot of cover, too, anyway, with their two tight ends, Hyde and Poyer. And they were so conscious of getting those safeties out toward the sideline, defending the, the perimeter, particularly at the end of the football game. How do you go all those yards in 13 seconds? Just giving up the middle of the football field. Kelsey down the middle of the football field. Nobody there. Mahomes ripping them in the middle of the football field. I know that you didn't want him to catch it and step out of bounds and all that. My goodness. So I don't think you necessarily put a spy on Mahomes unless you absolutely have to. The big key is staying in your rush lanes, not distorting your pass rush lane where he can take advantage of it. If you get out of your lane, he'll make you pay. Stay in your lane, contain him. Mush rush, contain him. Be disciplined in your pass rush lanes. If if uh, if you can do do that like they did without a spy on on Patrick, uh, not just Patrick Mahomes, a guy like Lamar Jackson, somebody like that. I mean, they get experience in doing these kind of mush rush pocket things with Lamar Jackson. Patrick Mahomes ain't no Lamar Jackson, you know, with his feet. So um, 
They may have to, though, at some point in time. I'm not ruling it out. Teams are spying Joe Burrow. They feel like he has enough movement skills and his feet can hurt you enough. The Raiders did do it some. And how about Joe Burrow while we talk about him for a second? How about the run he made on third down where he dove for the first down? The hell was sliding. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna slide and hope that they spot the ball properly because I'm moving the ball back. You know, it's not my feet, it's not where my feet are, it's where the ball is. Dive for that first down. And that's after he's been hit. And the thing about Joe Burrow, I've seen the greatest quarterbacks ever play, like a Tom Brady. When he got hit, he got affected. He would assume the fetal position. He would flinch. I've seen Tom Brady, when he was under pressure in the Super Bowl, go down, expecting to get hit, expecting pressure and going to the ground before they even got there. That's how they affected him mentally. Joe Burrow <laughs> never flinches, never even bats an eyelash or an eyebrow. I mean, this dude, he pops right back up like, man, you didn't, nothing, nothing bothers me. Doesn't cuss out his linemen, doesn't cuss out Samaj P. Ryan for bobbling a pass that turns into an interception that ended his streak of well over 200 throws that could be still going on now. I mean, he could be pushing in this game 250 throws without an interception, but that's football. That happens. He understands that. Goes right to the sideline after getting sacked nine times, actually 11. The two were negated by penalty and by timeout and getting hit a bunch of other times. Never like, what's wrong with you guys showing up people? Goes right to the sideline, sits on the bench, puts on his headset, gets grabs his computer. What do we got, coaches? What adjustment will we make? Let's move on. That 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 series is over. No, no, no reason lingering in that. Let, let, what are we gonna do? How, how do we adjust? How do we be better in the next series? How do we win this football game? This dude is a stud. He is. Physically tough, mentally as tough as anybody I've ever seen. And, and the players respond to that. Believe me, the players appreciate it and respond to it. This dude is special. And I'm not just talking about, you know, accuracy, all these. I'm talking about the intangibles. Tough, tough. Linemen respond to that, appreciate that. It's like, man, nobody's going to out-tough our quarterback. Nobody. And I'm going to make his life easier. I feel badly that I'm the reason that he got hit like that. Shame on me. It ain't happening again. And that's what has to happen. These guys have to have to buckle up and, uh, and and protect Joe Burrow because all he's going to do is make plays for you and win football games. This dude is the real deal. Never seen a quarterback any tougher. Never seen. And think about this. Riddle me this, Batman. <laughs> His rookie year, he only played 10 games. Ripped an ACL and MCL. Total reconstruction of the knee. Comes back to training camp, or, you know, sooner than thought. Rehabs. Dedicates himself. In the beginning of training camp, he admittedly said, I feel a little claustrophobic. I'm feeling it. You know, guys around me, I'm feeling I'm making an adjustment. After that rehab, you know, the tear my knee up, reconstruct it. Totally understandable. I'm, I don't like these guys. This cold. Look at him now. Are you kidding me? That is mental toughness. He said, yeah, I'm done with that. I'm good. My knee's good. <laughs> I'm, I'm not letting anything bother me. That, that's, you know how hard that is? It's brutally hard. Man, is he tough mentally. This guy is. He's going to win you a lot of football games. There ain't no doubt. Dan, the man says, do you think we're in better shape with the D line now than when David Grant had to step in after Crumry suffered the broken leg in the Super Bowl? You know, I think it's comparable. I think, uh, I think David Grant, uh, acquitted himself very, very well, but you know, let's face it. He wasn't Tim Crumry. Um, if he was, he would have been, you know, playing more snaps than, than he was playing, but you know, th that was, that's a good example of a guy stepping up. So yeah. I mean, I, I think you can draw a lot of analogies. Uh, over the years, there's a lot of cases where guys had to step up. And some guys, all they're waiting for is an opportunity to show they can play. And then it, it just takes off. So scenarios like this, you prove you can play, and you also prove you can't play. What's it going to be? Are you going to be in the, in the class that proves they can play? Or are you going to be in the class that proves they can't play? And then I, their NFL career is not going to last very long. Might might be over, in fact. 
guys to get out there and prove they can play, they make themselves some money. Not not only maybe with their current team, but there are 31 other teams watching, you know, and that's the thing about giving up nine sacks. It's the only game on television. The entire league is watching. <laughs> when you screw up, there's no hiding. If you gave up nine sacks in a regular season game, it'd be like, oh, geez, well, the Bengals gave up nine sacks. It was just like a little piece of news amongst all 32 other teams in the team and the in the league being covered that week. Now it's only you're you're one of eight teams. Now you're down to one of four, but at that time, one of only eight teams. And if the the coverage is intensified, every every big play magnifies, every mistake magnifies even more because people love to talk about the negative. So if you don't have a good performance, like the officiating crew in the Raiders game, right? Raiders Bengals game that screwed the whole thing up and they ain't officiating anymore in the playoffs, it's all based on performance. They get graded just like the players. If the player doesn't play well and he grades terribly, another guy's in. If the officiating crew doesn't uh, perform well, they get graded, another crew's in. You're done. Everybody saw it. If they, if they had a bad game like that, the Zebras during the season, wouldn't have been as big a news. But in the playoffs and in the Super Bowl, whoo, everybody's watching. The eye in the sky don't lie, and everybody's watching. All right, we're getting close to the end here, Dave. Victor Pate, 24. Greetings, Dave. So much was made about the performance of Mahomes and Allen in the divisional game, but nothing said about the horrible defensive play at key moments in the Bills-Chiefs games. Thoughts? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, I said uh, to, to my wife, Lynn, during the course of the game, this is an offensive clinic. I mean, th these guys are performing at such a high level. But defensive coaches, <laughs> this game tape won't make it to the clinics that they're going to and speaking at during the course of the season. Honestly, though, uh, in, in some cases, there were huge defensive problems, defensive mistakes made. But, man, these quarterbacks both com competed and performed at such a high level. Gosh, it, it, was, it was something to behold. But every single defensive coach in the country at any level was cring cringing. <laughs> Watching that football game, there there are no two ways about it. Uh, I mean, you know, when when defensive coordinators draw stuff up on the chalkboard, theoretically, you've got to answer to stop every play. When an offensive coordinator draws it up on the chalkboard, you've got a way to break down a defense and score every single play. Well, in this one, <laughs> it was taken from the chalkboard to the field a lot more uh, <laughs> a lot more effectively by the offensive football teams on both sides of it. And, you know, the unbelievable thing, the Buffalo Bills, number one in the National Football League in yards allowed, number one in the National Football League in points allowed, number one in the NFL in third down conversion percentage. They were number one in a half a dozen big categories. Mahomes made them look sick. Took them apart. I mean, just, just unbelievable. Took them apart. It was amazing to watch. It really was. They performed at such a high level. Everybody did. Yeah, we we got a. There's a guy named Fishman Marcus. He's a Kansas City fan who lives in Cincinnati. He's posting on the uh, during the live stream, and I think some of the Bengals fans are starting to get uh, get to getting him fired up at him a little getting, bit. Getting fired up a little bit, which is good to see. So, but uh, <clears throat> we respect anybody coming in and watching the live stream. And sure, making comments. Um, and Dave, we, we talked about this earlier, and we we're going to cut off here because we got ready for another interview we have today yes but, we got uh, brian callahan it's gonna be fun so but we talked about this and then there were some comments here we couldn't get to and we apologize for all the questions that we couldn't get right. to today if the Bengals win this football game and they advance to the super bowl there's a possibility the other team that could advance would be the san francisco 49ers right we talked about all the streaks that joe burrow and this Bengal team has taken care of home playoff win road playoff win you know after 31 years of right 31 victory. years without a victory they got that uh road oh and seven had never won on the road in the playoffs and, and he broke that uh now, now and it's only in his second year mind you as a as a quarterback uh the Bengals have won advanced to and won the afc championship game twice in franchise history so he can't break that record but never won a super bowl so that record could be broken by Joe Burrow 
in his second year as a starting quarterback and 0-2 against the 49ers. And if the 49ers advance to the Super Bowl and the Bengals advance three times, third time might be a charm, maybe Joe Burrow and this group. If this group could finish the first, would that be in the first? Whoo! Yeah. I mean, I played on a team in 1981 uh, when we went to Super Bowl 16. The team had never won a playoff game in franchise history. Home, road, Yugoslavia, China, anywhere. And we won. Won a playoff game. Obviously, they had never won an AFC championship. Won. So that, that football team in 1981 did two things that nobody is ever going to be able to tie. <laughs> That's the only time it can happen. This football team has done the same thing. I mean, the big one is winning a playoff game on the road. We went to the Super Bowl twice. The Bengals did. Why? Because the number one seed home field advantage didn't have to play a road playoff game. That's why you fight for the number one seed. Road playoff games are tough to win. Paul Brown, legend, Hall of Fame coach. Uh, he was the first coach of the Cincinnati Bengals to go in the playoffs, and he didn't win a playoff game. 0-2 in the playoffs. The only coaches in franchise history that have won playoff games, Boris Gregg, Sam Weish, Zach Taylor has now won two. How about that? about that, sports fans? Pretty strong. All right. I promise. Last question, Dave. Richard and Sarah, what's different about how the organization is run now compared to five years ago? Will they spend where needed in the offseason? Is there urgency for Mike Brown to see a championship at his age? Yeah, I mean, there's urgency for Mike Brown. Believe it. Believe me. Um, he's all football all the time. He's not an owner that has billion-dollar businesses and – a football team is just something to entertain his friends with. You know, I mean, it's like, why don't you come to my football? It, this is his life. He has no other businesses. I'm not saying he doesn't have other investments. I mean, all these owners have plenty of money and they invest in the stock more, whatever it is. But I'm talking about no other day-to-day -day business operation. It is the Cincinnati Bengals football team, family operation, daughter Katie, um, son-in-law Troy Blackburn. They got two daughters involved now. Elizabeth has done an unbelievable job coming in and, and they've done tremendous things with uh, the social, social media um, ruler of the jungle, big thing, a lot of fan engagement stuff. And honestly, the last two off seasons, the Bengals spent over a hundred million dollars in free agency, both times, both times they have cap when they have cap dollars to spend, they, they, they spend them. They're, they're always like in the top five in, uh, in spending. And they, they spent over $100 million these last two years. They built their defense through free agency, period. Here's some of the free agents. DJ Reader, two years ago, record amount of money spent on an interior defensive lineman. It's paid off. They traded for B.J. Hill, so he's in a special category. They traded Billy Price, a first-round draft pick, for B.J. Hill with the Giants. Ray Henderson signed him from the Saints. Big contract. He superseded DJ Reader in the amount of money they gave. Certainly panned out. 14 sacks during the season. Mike Hilton, slot corner from the Pittsburgh Steelers. One of the best slot corners in all of football. Free agent. Eli Apple, free agent from the Giants. Awuzie, free agent from Dallas Cowboys. Von Bell, free agent. Saints. One, two, three, four, five, six. Over half of the starters defensively. Free agency. They traded for one in this football game, B.J. Hill. Ogan Joby, who's now injured, he was another free agent acquisition. So technically it's seven. Seven of the 11 starters. Larry Ogan Joby, they signed from the Cleveland Browns in free agency. Sam Hubbard, draft pick. Jesse Bates, draft pick. Uh, Logan Wilson, Jermaine Pat Pratt, draft picks. Offensively, the balance of the team, the big part of the team is through the draft. So they... Drafted offense, free agency defense, put together a, a, a roster that during the course of the two years now, you know, it took a while, 625 and one. They paid a price doing this, but now they've got coaches in place. They, they, they like a lot of things they have in place. And in a lot of people's estimation, it gelled sooner than they thought. Nobody, nobody thought they were going to be in the, in the AFC championship game this year. I don't care who you are. Oh, I shouldn't say nobody. Zach Taylor, Joe Burrow, guys, a lot of guys like that. But I mean, from the outside looking in, everybody in that locker room 
felt like they could be here. But everybody on the outside looking in didn't really think it could happen realistically. Here they are, you know, like uh, like they've done when C.J. Uzamer started about what about us? And Joe Burrow said, no, 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 I don't like that underdog stuff. Enough of that. So C.J. changed it to it is us. That's this football team. It starts with their quarterback. Their quarterback is the leader of the earned confidence. And everybody else has got earned confidence feeding off of that quarterback's earned confidence. They're dangerous. They've proven they're dangerous. We'll see. I mean, they have to bring their A game. If they bring anything less than their A game to Arrowhead Stadium, they're in trouble. If the Chiefs bring their A game, it's going to be tough. If the Chiefs bring their A game and the Bengals don't, it's not going to be good. If, the, if they both bring their A game, it's going to be a battle. The Chiefs, again, this is their fourth straight AFC championship game they're hosting. They set the standard. They're 7-1 and one at Arrowhead in their last eight playoff games. They set the standard. They are the best team in the AFC. Can the Bengals knock them off that perch? Can't wait. Let's see. Awesome. Again, we want to thank everybody for taking part in In the Trenches with Dave Lapham's live stream today. We've got some great interviews coming up with coaches later this week, so be sure to watch tomorrow, Wednesday at noon. We have our weekly release, and then we'll have another release uh, probably Thursday and another release Friday, and then the keys on Saturday uh, as Dave's traveling out to Kansas City for the game. Again, if you've not done so, please hit the like button on the YouTube channel and also subscribe to Dave Lapham in the trenches on YouTube. We want to thank first our logistics again for lunch. Absolutely. And for taking care of us always in this great studio with they provide for us to do Dave Lapham in the trenches. They do it right. They do it right, Dave. You know, they, they set the bar. Yes. They set the bar of excellence. We're just trying to get there. You know what I mean? It's like they do it right. No question about it. And you guys do too. Very good fans, very knowledgeable fans. Appreciate each and every one of you. And if you're looking for a new career, Check out First Star Logistics. Sure. No doubt. All right, everybody. Thank you. Who day? Who day? Here we go. To Kansas City. Dave Lapham here. And every day, I am grateful for my experience to have played professional football. As a player, I realize self-motivation, leadership, and appreciating your teammates are key. At First Star Logistics, you can use those same attributes to create the life you want for you and your family. Build your future by working hard like I did. You'll see results both on and off the field. Call First Star Logistics today and be part of our winning team.